This is a laser that targets brown spots. So as someone who's getting tons of little sunspots, I'm becoming a spotty woman. That is definitely the treatment that I would opt to get right now. Hey everyone, it's Dr. Joyce Park, board certified dermatologist, and today I wanted to talk about everything that I've gotten done to my own face with regards to cosmetic treatments. So this is a question I've gotten asked on social media before, and some people actually don't believe me when I say that I have or had not gotten certain procedures done. So I just wanted to lay it all out there so you guys know these are the things I've considered, these are the things I've done, these are the things I want to do and are on my to-do list in the future. And this will only go over cosmetic treatments, but I'm not going to go into my own personal AM and PM skincare routine at the moment, but I can do that in a future video if you're interested. First off, let's talk about Botox. Botox is a very popular procedure that involves injections of a neurotoxin, the botulinum toxin, into certain muscle groups on your face in order to temporarily weaken those muscles. This isn't a permanent effect, as most people know, or definitely if you've got on Botox yourself, you know, the effects are not permanent and they only last around three to four months. And the more you do them, there is a possibility that you can form autoantibodies to the Botox. And so it could be possible that you have to switch from Botox to a different type like Dysport, but that goes beyond the scope of this video. I started getting Botox back when I was a resident in dermatology at NYU. And the main reason I got it was because it was readily available. And as trainees, we actually practiced on each other. So as a first year resident, we were given a batch of Botox by Allergan to practice with and train on each other. And basically our attendings, our kind of teaching physicians, our supervisors, they would set up these sessions for us outside of clinic time, or we would do it during lunchtime. And we would kind of pair up, we would draw dots, kind of map out where we wanted to inject the Botox on each of our faces. And then we would learn how to mix the Botox, draw up the Botox, and then do all the injections. I will say looking back, the injections we gave each other during training were much higher in dosages than I would use on myself now, despite having more wrinkles now. Thinking back, I was completely frozen after some of those sessions where we were injecting each other. I could not even lift my eyebrows. My frontalis was totally frozen. I remember my brows felt heavy, which is a side effect when you inject too much or too low in the forehead. There were many times when I could not frown at all. Like this, totally frozen, completely immobilized. My approach now when I get Botox is that I just want it to look natural. That's my approach when I get Botox for myself or if I give it to patients. I want it to look natural because I want people to still be able to move the muscles of their face and be able to have expressions. Sometimes my patients talk to me and when I bring up Botox, they say, oh, but I don't want to look like those frozen celebrities that I see on TV. Well, their faces look like that because they're getting too much Botox, too many units. Units is the unit of measurement we use to kind of dole out the Botox and to quantify it. If you're wanting a more natural approach, you can use less Botox and that'll still give you free range of movement. So the places that I typically got injected were my forehead area. I always got my glabella. I actually have one deep static wrinkle forming a vertical line right here. It's getting etched into my skin here. My mom has the exact same line. So it's like when I see her, it's like I'm looking into the future and I know what's gonna happen on my face. So this one is important to me. I usually get three injections on each side around my crow's feet because I have all these little fine wrinkles over here. I have in the past also gotten masseter Botox. I did that one time also at a training session because one of the other residents wanted to learn how to do it. And I said, go to town and you can inject my masseters. The masseter muscle is this muscle here that helps you chew. So if you put your hands here and you clench your jaw, you can feel this muscle kind of popping out. That's your masseter muscle. And in some people with overactive masseters, that can lead to kind of a bulging here. And so some people will want to inject these muscles in order to slim down their face and have a smaller, narrower face. So I was kind of interested in that because I do have kind of a large bulge here, but it didn't really make a huge difference in me. So I never did it again. You can also get masseter Botox injections for TMJ. If you have pain with jaw clenching, 
brushing and with teeth grinding, that's another place that we can inject Botox for some relief of that pain. So I started getting Botox injections, like I said, in residency. That was back in 2016, 2015, 2016. And I did that probably every six months until 2018 when I graduated. Then when I was in attending, I didn't have as ready access to it. I worked in a cosmetic setting where I was the only person there and I didn't really feel like injecting myself. So I got pretty lax on it. I would say I probably did Botox injections as an attending once a year between 2018 and 2021. And that would be because I had to ask a colleague to do it for me. I could inject myself, honestly, but I'm a little bit needle phobic and I'm really scared of pain. So the thought of sticking a needle in my own face just was not attractive to me. And most days I did not feel like doing that. Then I moved to Seattle. And since I started my virtual clinic, I no longer buy Botox as if I were seeing patients in person in a cosmetic practice. So since moving here, I've only gotten Botox once since the end of 2021. And that was when I traveled to New York to see my friend, Elise, Dr. Elise Love in New York. She did my Botox for me December, 2022. So probably 10 months ago now. And it wears off after three to four months. So it's totally gone by now. And I'm definitely seeing the wrinkles coming back on my face. But to be honest with you, I haven't picked it up again because it's not bothering me that much at the moment. One question I do also get a lot that I want to address is this idea of preventative Botox. Does it work? What is it? When should you start it? So the idea behind preventative Botox is that by paralyzing and weakening your muscle, then you're not able to form those facial expressions as deeply. And we know that wrinkles form over time because you repetitively make those same movements, causing those wrinkles to get deeper with each time you make that movement. So it would make sense that if you prevent yourself from making that movement, that facial expression in the first place, then that deep wrinkle will never form. So I have kind of mixed feelings about this. I think if you don't really see any wrinkles at all on your face, you don't need to get preventative Botox. And I think the proper time to really start considering Botox is when you are noticing that your lines are lasting longer and that they're lasting beyond when you're just making that face or beyond when you're moving that muscle. So for example, my frontalis muscles are pretty weak, but I have this line here. I don't know if you guys can see it, but I have this fixed line here and that's called a static wrinkle because it's there there, even when I don't move my face, even when I don't frown. That would be a time right when I notice the beginning of the, that line, that's when I would start injecting Botox into that area. It's honestly a personal decision as well. Some people want to be completely frozen. They don't want a single line on their face. Some people want still free range of movement, but not as many lines. And some people don't care if they have lines. I am always of the mindset of you do you, and I will just help you achieve your personal beauty goal. Beyond Botox, I have also gotten a number of laser therapy piece done. And these are my favorite procedures to get done and also to perform and the ones that I most likely want to get done again. As many of you know, I have rosacea and I will link below to my rosacea video and it is a struggle. My dad had rosacea really badly, papulonodular cystic rosacea bumps all over his nose and cheeks. I haven't gotten it to that extent, but since coming back from Singapore this summer where it was super hot and humid, my rosacea has been flaring. My rosacea also flared very badly in the past when I was a resident at NYU. In fact, when I first moved to NYU that summer to start dermatology residency, my whole face got so flushed and red with rosacea acne type lesions that I didn't even know what to do. I was a new resident and so I actually went to go see one of my attendings as a patient and he diagnosed me with rosacea and put me on prescription medications. So one of the really great laser therapies that we have for rosacea is the pulse dye laser or PDL for short. And this laser works by selectively targeting blood vessels. And it basically zaps and closes the blood vessels without damaging surrounding skin structures. And it usually takes, depending on how bad your rosacea is, how red you are, it can take anywhere between four to six treatments to really get rid of that redness. It's really great for total facial flushing. It's great for little cherry angiomas if you have certain little spots that are red. It's really great for telangiectasias or visible squiggly blood vessels 
this laser is really great for those things. It is most effective if it causes a little bit of bruising at the day of treatment. That's how you know it worked because it delivered enough energy to cause damage to those blood vessels. But you do have to be very careful not to go in the sun or have your rosacea flare up again because then that will basically counteract the effects of the laser and you'll be back to square one. I've gotten several sessions of pulse dye laser before. I think I've gotten it maybe three times when I was in residency between 2015 and 2018. And I think I received it one more time with my friend, Dr. Christman, when I visited Boston in March of 2022. So I do need it again, but again, I no longer have access to all these procedures and devices that I used to. Next is intense pulsed light. So this is not actually a laser because lasers only target one wavelength, whereas IPL is a light, so multiple wavelengths. This laser I think of as more of a softer laser that is not as selective and can target browns and reds. And so this can help with solar lentigos, sunspots, some light hyperpigmentation, and it can also help with a little bit of light redness or flushing, but it's not going to be as powerful as lasers that are designed to specifically treat redness or lasers designed to specifically treat brown spots. I had IPL done on me when I was in attending at Sutter Health, and this was also for training purposes. So we were just practicing on each other. My friend who was my former chief resident and I did two sessions on each other about a month apart. I like doing this on each other because I want to experience what my patients experience. So basically you lie down, you wear goggles, you feel this cool block of, it feels like something very cold and icy on your skin. And then you just kind of inch along and zap, 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 zap. And then over the next three to four days, I developed what felt like rough coffee grounds on my face. You're not supposed to peel it off or anything. Be really gentle with it. No exfoliants, no acids, no retinols or retinoids during that time. And then over time, those little coffee ground scabs will just fall off and you'll be left with less hyperpigmentation and redness. To be honest with you, I didn't see a huge difference with the IPL treatments, but that was just me. I would personally prefer to go for laser treatments, which are more selective, more targeted, and more intense and more powerful. And yeah, you'll probably ha have higher risk of side effects, but not if you go to the right laser operator who knows what settings to use. The third type of laser that I've had done that is probably my favorite given my skincare concerns, maybe tied with pulse dye laser, is the PicoWay laser. And this is a laser that targets brown spots. So as someone who's getting tons of little sunspots, I'm becoming a spotty woman. That is definitely the treatment that I would opt to get right now. No matter how good I am with my sunscreen, no matter how diligent I am with reapplying or wearing my ridiculously large sun visor, it's impossible to completely prevent sun exposure. I mean, look at me. I sit next to a window all day. So the PicoWay laser is specifically designed to deliver short, short picosecond bursts of energy to specifically target melanin. And it can target not only melanin, it can also help with tattoo removals and all sorts of disorders of hyperpigmentation, like specific types of nevises like nevus of oda it can also help with melasma and it's great for sunspots so that's probably the one that i would want the most right now given all my sunspots and i've had it done one time before this was when i saw my friend again dr chrisman in boston last year this was march 2022 yes 2022 and she did one session for me and the downtime was really not bad at all she actually did it for me on the first day that i got to boston and then i had to go to a conference for five days and I had no issues, no bruising. I didn't have darkening of the spots. I had a slight sandpapery, rough, gritty texture on my face for maybe three days, but I could easily cover that up with makeup and that fell off after about a week. And I do notice that my sunspots are significantly lighter. I also wanna point out that the Pico Way laser is another favorite because it's safe to use in melanated skin. For anyone whose skin is not super, super white, which we call Fitzpatrick one on the Fitzpatrick skin color scale, there is a chance that you can get burned by laser due to the energy that's delivered to the skin. And so the nice thing about the PicoWay laser is that it's safe to use in all skin types. So I really appreciate that. Aside from those lasers, I haven't gotten any fillers done, even though I'm very interested in getting under eye tear trough filler to kind of help with these dark circles under my eyes. I have some volume loss and hollowing there. I think that's most 
mostly what I would be interested in. I am a baby and a wuss when it comes to pain. And even though I think Fraxel sounds very appealing for rejuvenation, for reducing fine lines, for helping you build collagen, I am kind of scared of the pain. So I have not pursued that and don't plan to pursue that for now. The other thing I wanted to mention is that there is no one size fits all treatment approach when it comes to cosmetic dermatology. So these are all procedures I've done that have worked for me, but they may not necessarily fit you and what your skincare needs are. So the best way to figure out what you need for your skin type and your skin concerns is to talk to your dermatologist. And if you live in California or Washington, you can actually book an appointment online with me. I do second opinions, I do beauty consultations, and even though I can't be the one actually giving you the procedure, I can tell you what I think you would benefit from depending on your skin type and your skin concerns. I hope this video was helpful to go over all the cosmetic treatments I myself have gotten done as a dermatologist. And please feel free to leave any questions or comments below. I love to hear from you and I will see you next time. Bye!